to my final guest this evening, ladies and gentlemen, we have four. Um, now, our final guest has launched his last three novels at the Salon, um, and I'm thrilled, three, last three novels, and I'm thrilled to say that he's back here tonight to launch his 16th novel. <laughs> yes. That's his editor screaming. Um, <laughs> The, the novel is called uh, Take Nothing With You, and it's a story of coming of age and of coming out. Eustace grows up by the sea in a house that would be grand if it wasn't an old folks' home, in a town that would be grand if it wasn't Western Supermare. <laughs> uh, Patrick tells me he did toy with calling it a town called Weston, or a place called Weston. Sorry, that joke would have worked better if I got the title right, wouldn't it? A place called Weston. Anyway, the formica of Eustace's 1970s childhood is replaced with mahogany when he discovers the cello and the world's most glamorous and dangerous music teacher, Carla Gold. Eustace recounts the story of his childhood from the confines of a lead-lined room, which makes it sound like one of Sarah's novels, um, but, it, but it's not. All will be explained in a minute. Um, it's a sharp yet gentle story about the transfigurative, and I use that word advisedly, transfigurative power of music, friendship, and love. You will love it. Please welcome Patrick Gale. <laughs> I feel we should be playing the Little Mary Sunshine song from Chicago <laughs> now, because that's sort of what this book is. It's not Little Mary Sunshine, there's actually lots of There's shade. a lot of deep it's darkness in the middle of it, but yeah. we won't give that away. No, well, is that you telling me not to say the Mary spoilers? I wasn't going to do that anyway, I'm very professional. Um, but yes, there is a lot of darkness in the middle, but it is a funny book, and I think this is what's interesting. So. It was, no, it is funny, I laugh lots, I mean, there are lots and lots of lines that I remember. Eustace knew well from reading magazines the importance of table lamps. <laughs> there you go. Half so, the men in the room got that joke. Yeah. <laughs> and the other half were tops. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we are. Um, so, um, so tell us, tell us about Eustace and why is he in this lead-lined room? Poor Eustace. Yes, when we, when we first, shall I read you a little bit that explains yeah. it slightly? When we first meet Eustace, um, it's in the present day, and. <clears throat> He's very well healed. Um, he's a property developer, and he's living in his late lover's lovely house in Kensington. So all is well. Um, and his very bossy professional cellist girlfriend, is, girlfriend as in friend of the girl. girl, is fed up with him being single um, and moaning about it. So she gets him onto a dating app, um, which half the gentlemen in the room will be familiar with. <laughs> and. Um, this first little bit is about what happens when he, he goes on the app. So he, <laughs> well, like the, we've got significant BBC people here. Oh, we don't okay. we don't name brands. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, he goes he goes on this 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 app this nameless <laughs> app, <laughs> and um, and he 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 meets somebody uh, who is a very very long way away. He's a, a serving member of the army. Um, out in the Middle East, but they fall in love even though they haven't met. Um, and in almost the same breath, Eustace discovers that he has cancer. But at this point, he's just met this chap, not in the flesh. <clears throat> Nothing about his meeting of Theo was promising. Theo was 20 years younger. He was in the army, and he was pretty. Pretty would normally have put Eustace off. He tended to be drawn to men with rough edges, evidence of wear and tear, a bit of heft or receding or departed hair. He had always found prettiness poignant, doomed as it was to pass, an outright beauty daunting. His possibly unfair assumption was that beauty went with a need for reassurance, whereas imperfect men would be grateful for the attention and accordingly generous. <laughs> However, the desert camouflage and boots the occasional sweat patch or glimpse of an enormous and unambiguous gun about his person seemed to balance out Theo's puppyish looks, as did his fearless persistence. You forget there are two of us making choices here, Theo texted when Eustace had felt obliged to post a suggestion that he would usually have gone for grizzled sergeant major over smooth-skinned captain. But our names are impossible together. We sound like cat breeders. I was nicknamed Stash at school, Eustace admitted, and Sluice. 
I think I can cope with Eustace. Theo spent several days after that pretending he wasn't really a roughy tufty soldier at all, but the company's cook, whose pride and joy was his cake decorating and pastry making. He sent photographs of a succession of birthday cakes for the officers and men, each camper than the last, each bravely greeted by Eustace with another compliment. Finally, he confessed that the pictures had been random finds off Google to test and alarm. He was actually a fairly senior officer doing something clandestine. There was sand, though, and date palms, and once a glimpse of spectacular ruins that looked like, but couldn't have been, Palmyra. He also admitted he had landed his job because of his two degrees in Arabic. At this point, they stepped away from the app and onto Skype, because Eustace pretended not to believe him about the Arabic. Goaded to prove it, Theo chatted away in a surprisingly deep voice while shaving topless and driving Eustace wild by refusing to speak a word of English before grinning, reaching out to the shelf above his sink with a soapy finger and hanging up. <laughs> it was a short step to texting one another images or bulletins from their wildly contrasting days. Eustace introduced Theo to his whippet, Joyce, to his cello, to Kensington Gardens, and to the assembling ladies of the orchestra's cello section, in exchange for meeting a tank full of sweaty squaddies, a scorpion, and a full moon reflected in an oasis. Then Theo happened to Skype while Eustace was having supper, and, amused, went to fetch his own tray of food and can of Coke. And so they slipped into the comforting habit of weekly supper dates. They made a point not only of regularly eating together, but downloading the same books to read or, when army broadband permitted, watching the same television programme simultaneously. Eustace on the sofa with Joyce, Theo sprawled on his bunk. The move from text to video allowed Eustace to latch onto and collect the little imperfections, which only made Theo more endearing. The small chip of one of his incisors, the way his thick eyebrows didn't quite match, a slight tendency to stutter when he was excited, as though his thoughts outran his tongue. And the intimacy of their conversations threw up intriguing parallels between them, less than perfect childhoods, an unfashionable tendency towards monogamy, a belief that dogs were sent to teach us how to love. Eustace dreaded ringing him at a bad moment. You mean with bullets flying? I hate to tell you, but I probably wouldn't answer. <laughs> That's even worse. Now if I ring you and you don't answer, I'll be thinking IED. So they agreed Eustace could text whenever he liked, but that Theo would initiate all calls as his life was more complicated. Because they had deleted what Theo called the app of doom and become roundedly human to one another by talking rather than texting, they resisted doing the usual sordid, appy things, like beating off in unison. Although, thanks to a waterproof cover on Theo's tablet and a cunning <laughs> suction pad Eustace found for his, they did take a couple of showers together. <laughs> For the most part, they talked, as any new lovers must. They told their stories. Eustace learned that Theo was teetotal because his parents were drunks, and confided in turn that his relationship with Gwyn had verged on the abusive, and that his one with his mother wasn't straightforward either. They laid tentative, then increasingly definite plans for Theo's next home leave, which was in four months. Naomi demanded details, of course, encouraging him every turn, encouraging him at every turn and brushing aside any doubts he expressed with characteristic pronouncements. Prudery at our age is as unconvincing as home dye jobs, was one. <laughs> what are you scared of? That he might rearrange your tidy life a little, was another. Her final pronouncement, after she had been briefly introduced to Theo at the start of a Skype call before coming over all girlish and making a hasty exit, was that this latest twist in his life story was almost unbearably sweet. If I'm honest, I only got you on the app to get you some healthy rumpy-pumpy to help you forget Gwyn. 
Only you could dive into a lake of pure sex and come up like some Labrador with something so bloody wholesome. (laughs) (laughs) Have we time for a little more? Yes, go. Um, So, my lord and master here said we must have a now and a then. So here's a bit of then. So we're back. um, God how many years earlier, a very long time earlier, when Eustace is only eight and living in Western Supermare with his parents. Now, his parents are rather um, ill-matched, to put it kindly. His father is sweet and completely ineffectual. His mother, like a lot of the women of that generation, um, is over-educated for what she's actually doing in her life and therefore immensely frustrated and almost permanently angry. This is a little scene where their lives are completely transformed forever by a first meeting with this cellist called Carla Gold. And now, of course, I can't find the way. Um, I should explain that Eustace has already tried to learn one instrument, the clarinet, only it didn't last for very long because his teacher was sent to prison for kiddie fiddling. Um, <clears throat> it's the 70s. And it's the 70s. And poor Eustace, who nobody counsels to check if he's OK or if, if Mr Buck ever took him upstairs, um, is slightly miffed that Mr Buck didn't ever take him upstairs. <laughs> and at this point, it's all a bit nebulous, but what he'd really like to do is learn the harp. Um, and his mother is trying to stamp on that as rather kind of not very manly. It's a recital and we're going, his mother announced, by way of explaining why they couldn't watch World About Us, which was a Sunday evening custom for him and his father, like winding the clocks and taking out the dustbins. God knows we get little enough high culture in this town. When we do, it needs supporting. She had even dressed up in a long black dress and silver sandals, which meant he had to wear his school uniform and his father a suit and tie. The recital happened in St. Joseph's, the Catholic Church, which was an adventure in itself, and was given by a cellist called Carla Gold, who had inexplicably moved to the area from London, and a pianist from Bristol. Eustace was resentful at missing World About Us, since he disliked changes in routine, but forgot everything. Television, homework, the hardness of his chair, the moment Miss Gold strode onto the stage. She was young, younger than his mother, and tall and very striking, with a great man, a great mane of tawny, curling hair like a mane, a dramatic nose, sorry, a great mass of tawny, <laughs> curling hair. I've got men on the brain, like a man. <laughs> a dramatic nose. She regularly turned aside on her longer bow strokes and hands and arms as gracefully controlled as a ballerina's. Her pianist was as glamorous as she was and wore white tie and tails, which set off his olive skin and neatly trimmed black beard. He had an exotic surname. Persian, apparently, his father informed them, rather too loudly. Or must we say Iranian now? They played two sonatas, the third Beethoven one and the one by Rachmaninoff. And for an encore, Carla Gold returned to the stage alone and finally spoke. Her voice was warm and lightly accented. Told you, his father told his mother, again too loudly. She was born Goldberg or Goldstein. They often do that. His mother shushed him and he laughed, nudging Eustace so they could be boys together, united against the impossible woman with whom they lived. Thank you so much, Carla Gold said. I'd like to play you the prelude from the third Bach suite. It begins with a C major scale and arpeggio, which my incredible teacher, Jean Kerwin, always said was all anyone starting the cello needed to play for their first year. And I like to think it shows Bach taking an instrument which until then had been largely for accompaniment and showing just what it was capable of. It begins with a downward scale and arpeggio, and then he opens the range out and out until it soars like a great C major eagle. So there was a titter and then an awed hush as she sat back on her piano stool, thrust out a shapely, sandaled foot to her left, gazed up at the top left-hand reaches of the church, took an audible breath, 
as though about to sing and began to play. She didn't simply play the notes. She played as though urgently communicating. Listen, her playing said, this really matters. Eustace was enthralled and clapped so enthusiastically when she was done that his father laughed and his mother murmured, not the harp then. <laughs> Had Carla Gold silenced the applause and said, now you must leave everything behind and follow me wherever we must go, Eustace would have obeyed her without a backwards glance. Thank you. Thank you. I would too, at that point. <laughs> She's Look quite a, a woman, She Carla. really is quite a woman. She, she, there are shades of Brodie about her, aren't there? Shades, shades of Mr. Shades Brody. of Brodie, and she's crossed... Well, I've cross-pollinated her with all manner of amazing cellist women I knew when I was little, yes. um, including Radu Lupu's wife. Does anyone ever know... Has anyone ever seen a woman called Elizabeth Wilson play the cello? No, I think I'm safe. She was incredible, but she had this electric hair, yeah. and Winchester in 1972 had never seen the like. <laughs> um, I mean, she wore amazing harem pants and hot pink silk, and she was incredible, but she was also this phenomenal player who just made you, like Carla, think that nothing else mattered. I, mean, I think what's really interesting for me is a person who, at school, I played the, the flute. It will not surprise you to learn. <laughs> um, I have a wonderful I did for one sure. term, but my, the woman who taught me had a very bad breath, and it put me off. Oh. That's nasty. Oh, especially if you were sharing yeah. an instrument. Oh, well, that yeah, would yeah, she awful. would demonstrate, and I'd want to wipe it, and I couldn't. No, that's yeah. not good. Yeah. Mine was vicious, and she, my posture is never great, and she would make <laughs> me stand against a door um, so that, you know, I, she could see how I was breathing, and she'd poke you uh, with a pencil if, if you slumped in one time. Mm. She'd poke me with the sharp end, and it stuck. Ooh, um, abuse. And she did not remove it, no. and I didn't either, and I just kept playing. Anyway... <laughs> Um, There's a lot of suffering when children this, learn well, this is what classical I instruments. There, there, there is a great deal of suffering. Well, what I wanted people embarks. who hadn't been through my childhood to realise is that actually it's not so different from gymnastics or ballet, which are the two other things small children have to start at small yeah. and then suffer like hell physically and mentally for about five years and then probably be rejected. So That's how, the other thing. How I mean, did, it's, how did, it's, did, so you saw this woman with the crazy hair in, in, in Winchester and uh, you were just... Spellbound. Yeah, but I wasn't allowed to have lessons with her because she only took grade eight pupils and above. She was really right. top notch. But I, yeah, they were totally spellbound. I had a succession of amazing. I had no idea how amazing they were. And that's the thing. I had a, a blessed childhood musically because we just had these incredible teachers and I just thought that was normal life. Mm -hmm. um, but I put a lot of that into this. But I also wanted to put in the transformative power of all that stuff which I think has made me very resilient. Eustace, without giving away too much of the plot, Eustace goes through some pretty strong stuff yeah. as a child. I mean, yeah. you know, traumatic things happen. Yeah. But he has this ever so slightly India rubber quality, which we see as an, when we meet him first as an adult. He's quite resilient. He is resilient, and that was one of the, one of the many rejected titles for the novel. Um, was to do with resilience, yes. It was um, studies for resilience. Because it is about how this musical training stands him in very good stead. Um, how, how, I mean, I didn't understand until I read the book that you, your fingers and thumbs would actually split and bleed when you were learning to play the cello. Oh, my God, yes. Well, what, one of the first titles for the book, which my publishers rejected out of hand because they said it sounded like a book about sex, was, um, was Thumb Position. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you all think it's about <laughs> sex, don't you? It's not. Thumb position is when you know you've really grown up as a cellist. It's the moment when <laughs> so you, your hand work. comes down the fingerboard like this for most of the positions, but when you get up to fifth position, you're stretched over the cello, but your thumb is still behind the fingerboard. But for thumb position, the thumb comes out and then has to press into these strings, which are like cheese wire. When you're eight years old, a high-tension metal string going into your thumb, and then your teacher says, now give me some vibrato, so you have to rub and roll on the cutting string, and then you have to slide. I mean, it, it hurts, but it's, it's a wonderful moment. It's the equivalent for a cellist of when the ballet child is first given the permission to dance on blocks yeah. and dies to have her shoes fill up with blood, because then she'll know she's really getting there. It was the same with, with thumb position. When you first had your thumb cut open, you could show it to your friends and say, you yeah, know, I'm hard now. Oh. I'm, I'm doing it. That's
That is like the most middle class version of hard ever. <laughs> <laughs> but feel, feel. I still, I still have the pad. I can actually see it. Yeah. Well, I'm I still, can, I'm still a cellist. I know, I know so cellist. grown up cellists, it's oh hard God, there. It's actually, yeah. It's quite. It's like a callus. Yeah. That's what stops it hurting. But it takes a so while. It so it doesn't hurt now. No. But no. it did then. So why did you persist as a child? And why did Eustace persist? Which I imagine two sides. <sighs> you want to be the best. Yeah. And and also you want to. It's it's very hard to describe because. Music comes into your life as a child as this mystery language. And it's a literature as well. Music, I remain addicted to music because it's this literature, which is different depending on, just as a book is different depending on who reads it or a play is different depending on the actors. So every piece from Bach to Rachmaninoff will vary depending on who plays it. So you as alone as a child have this amazing opportunity to make it yours. Right. And it's like an amazing adult, the Carla Gold or whoever, coming into your life and giving you this ladder yeah. and you can't see the top and they just say, if you can do this, if you're prepared to split your thumb, you can follow me up the ladder and let's see how far we go. And you know, what fat, shy child can resist a glamorous woman saying, let's climb a ladder to, yeah. to the heavens and be better than everyone? Yeah. And also there's that constant risk. You know you will never quite be good enough. Yeah. I mean, most of classical music is about rejection. Most of us know that we will never be in the 1%. I don't um, want yeah, to give too much away about what's happened to, to, to Eustace. Obviously, he's, he's, he's not a musician. We, for reasons no, because when we first meet him, he's a recovering banker. Yes, we know he's, he's, he's come out the other side. Um, <laughs> but um, we, won't, we won't talk about why, why he gave up his music just yet, but why did, why did you, and why did you wait until you were 40 to pick a cello back up? Um, I wasn't good enough. You were. I, I had a similar moment to the one Eustace has when right. a wonderful teacher said, you're good enough that this will be with you all your life, and it will give you sucker and whatever, but do not take it any further. As in, if you think you're going to be a professional, do not, because that, that way lies madness, and you'll end up on the scrap heap. Um, and at the, at the very heart of this book is this amazing woman, Jean Kerwin, yes. who is based on a real-life cello guru called G Jane Cowan. I changed the name slightly, but anyone who knew Jane Cowan will recognize her. And she used to run this amazing, probably now it would be illegal, school called the International Cello School in her husband's crumbling pile in the Scottish borders. And a few of us would get picked to go up for a holiday course. And it was insane. It was like total immersion. And we did things like she would make us lie on the floor of the ballroom while she shut all the shutters. We'd be in pitch darkness. And she would play Haydn to us. And that was it. She would just play Haydn. And then <laughs> if you dared to laugh or giggle or anything, she would say, some of the men in that orchestra were in Nazi death camps and survived, and still they are playing Haydn, a new dare to love. And of course, we thought she was amazing. <laughs> um, and what I realized at the end of the, my first one of these holiday courses is that they were a recruitment drive. Because yeah. a very few of her students who came on the holiday courses as 13, 14 year olds would be picked to be her chosen eight or nine peoples who lived there full time. Mm. Um, thank God I wasn't picked, because I have friends who were picked, and they've been kind of picking up the pieces in their lives ever since. Of course. <laughs> she pretended to the parents, oh, I'll teach them everything. All she would teach them is music and maybe Italian or German. But, yeah. And there was a woman from the village who came to do maths, I think. <laughs> but basically, you know, she would just take you, and if you weren't good enough to be a professional, that was your life screwed for, yeah. for a while. Um, she was amazing, though. She created Stephen Isselis, who some of you may have heard of, who is one of the, the most amazing cellists currently working. Um, so, but J Jane took me on one side and said, you know, maybe not for you, um, but keep it up, but don't. It was a really kind thing to do, actually, because at that age, my life was in such freefall. My family was in meltdown, hmm. and the music was my one, it was my life raft. What was happening to your family at that time? Oh, it was very some tedious stuff. But actually, one thing of it I did put in the book, which was what happened to my mother, which was being in a car accident so bad that she nearly died and yeah. lost the power of speech, and, and then came back a fundamentalist Christian, which was really tough. Um, and I mean, she's when... dead now, so I was able to put all that in. Yeah. Um, but wow. she never did to me what the mother does to Eustace. No. We never went quite that far. No, and she does go very far. 
She, yeah. Yeah, she yeah. really does. Let's talk a bit more about the bottom of the, of the ladder, about Western Superman in the 70s. And why yes. else would you set a novel there? I mean, I thought Manila was extreme, but well, uh, Western no, Superman. Western, Western is a very misunderstood place, I realised once I went back to research the book, because it does have beautiful houses and interesting bits, but it's one of those very English seaside towns which has been looking back to its 18th century heyday for mm. a very long time. Um, and it's now the dumping ground for the lost, basically. If you go to Western, you'll suddenly realize that not only are there old people's homes in every other house, but it's also got all the high drug dependency units. It's mm. got the homes for the alcoholics who are kind of recovering. And it's got halfway houses for people who've been thrown out of psychiatric hospitals. Mm. So it's full of these people who are really struggling. kind of lost yeah. and it struck me I went there quite innocently to do a reading in the library and had unfortunately for Western had an afternoon at leisure and wandered around and started to think and I thought my god this would have been the worst place to grow up um, so naturally I, I had to set a book there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually it's a place it's a place that forms Eustace as well because I yeah. think there's uh, we nowadays are quite you know, we raise our children without boredom I think my generation was really lucky. We had incredibly boring summer holidays. And I'm a great believer that boredom gives rise to creativity. And I think if you grow up in a shit town where there's nothing to do but hang around on your bike and mooch, yeah. Yeah. or maybe read a book, yeah. um, you stand far more chance of those creative connections happening in your brain because you have to make your own fun. Yeah. I think we fret too, far too much now about keeping children occupied. They need to be allowed to mooch. To mooch. Yeah. Um, there's some hardcore parents in here. <laughs> I just leave my child in the yard with some pebbles. <laughs> She's very happy. Um, um, we have our roving or stumbling microphones, as they are, um, for questions for Patrick. Um, so if you want to put your hand up, a microphone will make its way to you at some point. I can't. There's somebody here. Yeah. The microphone will make its way to you. And, so, and somebody else there as well. Two on the same table, very inquisitive. I have to say, for me, it sent me um, going to YouTube lots to check out the music, because I didn't oh, know good. a lot of the music. Good, good, good. So I, my big worry with it was that the music would get too technical, a bit like the farming in A Place Called Winter. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Place Called Winter, I cut out yards and yards of stuff about ploughing. Yeah. Um, and, but and not I, in this book. No, I did the same with this. I cut out a lot of the technique in this book as well. I mean, yeah. you think there's a lot in there, but there was a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Um, but my big worry was that it would alienate readers who didn't know about classical well, music I, and I, thought they weren't interested. But my hope is that you get it on an emotional, sexual level. Yeah. Because it is quite primal for you. It, 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 it's it, very, you know, uh, for me, um, it's, it's a theme that you explore all the time, which is about passion and the price that we pay for having mm. a passion. Um, and music in this book is the medium for exploring that theme. Well, that you're and always it's, it's how at. a little boy who thinks he's the only one comes to discover he's not the only one yes. as well. Yes. Um, it's got a very early example of a kind of 1970s gay household, yes. which he stumbles into almost by chance, and they prove his... His saviors, in a I way. Love the, I love that he finds the, the pianist, who will not surprise you to learn, is perhaps homosexual. Um, and he lives with another man in Damien Bristol. Damien fancies the pianist. I've already checked. Yeah. I do. And you fancied <laughs> his boyfriend. But anyway. Well, um, you, um, um, but, you know, and I, I thought that was a kind of magical thing. And as a child, I would have absolutely, I'm sure my parents would have hated it, but I would absolutely have loved mm. to have found two lovely gay musicians um, to show me the way. Um, it's a kind of fantasy. Well, and the key, the key thing that they do for him, actually, is to lend him books. Yeah. Yeah, which was totally my, my experience as, a, as, as a, a sort of hopeless, stunted, stunted sort of rather fat teenager um, who knew he was gay but had no way of expressing it really. Uh, it was books, so you know, older, older gay men lent me things like Dancer from the Dance. Yeah. And then I, then I discovered Gay's the Word and I never looked back. Um, I used to go up there, I'd tell my mother I was going to the National Gallery, and I'd go, I'd come up on the train from Winchester, I'd go to the National Gallery, and I'd buy some postcards to prove I'd been. And then, <laughs> then I would hair up to Bloomsbury and go to Gaze the Word and buy all these books I had to sort of hide down my trousers when I got home. <laughs> they were lifesavers. It really. is a lifesaver, it's like an incredible yeah. bookshop. So we were ignoring the question. Um, so yes, question. It's a really nice question. Do you Ooh. always describe your most beautiful Do characters through their imperfections? Well, I love imperfection. And I've, I've, always felt, um, I've always felt that's the way in for your reader as well. Because if, if you describe a, a, a really kind of shiny character who has nothing wrong with them, 
they're probably a psychopath, and the reader will have no way in. If you want your reader to, to fall in love with your characters, you, you need a few chipped teeth and wonky eyebrows and um, things going not quite right to let them in. And that lets me in, too. That's where my sympathies flow. And, yeah. Um, it's interesting, we haven't actually mentioned about the lead lined room, I just realized. He has to go in there because. That was got... another rejected title. This book has so many. The lead lined room. The lead lined room was the working title until I'd finished my book. I mean, first it's better draft. than thumb position. Yeah, but it's a bit Valman. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> That's <It's> my publicist. She's <laughs> drunk, pay no heed. Um, no, the lead lined room is a bit Val McDermott, it has yeah. to be said. Um, well, he's in the lead lined room because he's had to take radioactive medication. Yes, th those of you who haven't been through this yet, if you, if you get um, thyroid cancer... I mean, not many of them, I'm hoping. No, but, yeah. not many of you, hope, but, but um, Eustace has thyroid cancer, and one of the standard ways of treating it is this radioactive iodine treatment, which, it's a pill, it's one pill, but the pill is so radioactive, you have to be in a lead lined room to take the pill, and you are then totally radioactive for up to two days afterwards. So you can take nothing into the room that you can't leave behind. Mm. And so the one thing Eustace takes into the room with him is a little MP3 player that his bossy girlfriend gives him, which is entirely recordings of her playing the cello. <laughs> but, of course, these are all pieces from their shared childhood, yeah. which give rise to the story you then go on to read. It is an incredibly useful plot device, shutting <laughs> your central character in a room with nothing to do but reflect. For yeah, yeah hours. it's handy, isn't it? <laughs> it's very handy. Um, it's a fantastic novel. It will really, really, really make you laugh. The dark bits are dark, but you really will laugh. I enjoyed it immensely. Please join me in thanking Patrick Gale. Thank you. Thank you so much.